Ja, ons is al een paar dag in die tweede gedeelte van ons lockdown en ons het ook hoop ons aan mekaar nou al bykie in die oog kan kyk en saam keier. Maar um, dit het nou nie gebeur nie en hier is ons eindelijk bevoorrag om net so bykie weer by jou en jou huis te kom keier. Mag jou hart vir oogend verrijk word dit, dit wat jy gaan beleef in die volgende, volgende klomp minute. Um, baie, baie wel. Ons so blij jy tyd gemaakt, ons so blij jy, jy is deel van, van, van die bijeenkomst. Ek wil jou nooit, ek wil jou aanmoedig om, om saam met ons te kom sing en aanbid, wanneer ons een paar liekie saam speel. Uh, ek is seker die meeste van jou familie lede, is daarom redelijk bewus van jou sangtalent, so niemand gaan geskok wees as jy so, so bykie van die nood afsing nie, maar dit gaan oor, oor connect, om so bykie connectie met die heren te, om te verbind, om, om, om daar in jou huis so deel van ons lof en aan, aanbidding te wees. Wees deel, kom maak, neem deel. Ons wil jou ook aanmoedig om, om met ons contact te maak. As jy enige, enige behoefte, of het net is om te gesels, of om so'n bykie jou hart te deel, as daar op ander areas nood het, daar kus jou kostkaste um, so'n bykie leeg en jy is bekommer. As het blief, kom praat met ons, stuur WhatsApp met die gemeente sy foon toe, of, of bel een van die, van die, van die pastore, ons wil rechtig graag by jou uitkom. Ek het die gevoel dat volgens die boodskap vir jou betekenis gaan heen. So luister mooi en, en hoor en beleef volgens wat jy moet beleef en hoor. Mag dit jou geestelik voet, mag dit jou uitdaag, mag dit jou wie of niet verbind aan, aan Jesus Christus. En ek gaan nou een gebed doen en, en daarmee wil ek hierdie dienst of hierdie bijeenkomst open en ek wil net vir jou sê, dankie dat jy hier is en, en mag jy eigenlijk gees rechtig in jou hart en spraak lewe volgens. Kom ons bid saam. Heere, eer aan u en dankie dat u nog steeds die, die ware ek is. is. Dankie dat ons op u kan staat maak, dankie dat ons op u kan vertrouw, dankie dat ons kan weet dat, dat wanneer ons as lichaam van Christus functioneer, um, dat u die hoof is, dat u in beheer is, en dat nie een van ons in die onbekend is, of dat u van ons vergeet, of dat u nie weet wat in ons wereld aan gaan. Ek wil bid dat u ons aan lof en aan bring sal beleef en ervaar ek, Ek bid jyre dat dit wat jy wil deel, dat jy die woord, mensens harte sal gaan raak. Ek bid dat ons geestelike oore sal oopwees om te hoor wat jy vir ons wil sê. Hier is jy dag en jy geleend het, jy mense, en wat het voorig om net saam te kan bid, saam te kan wees. Ons eer jy vir oogend, want jy is ons verzorger. Amen.
en dit het my weer op die klap besef hoe bevoerig is ons om die Heer onder al omstandighede te kan ombid. Dit maak die saak waar ons ons self bevind nie. Ek herinner ook myself aan die Bijbel hoeveel keer mense die Heer op baie inaardige plekke ombid het en hoe dat hulle hulle self in moeilike omstandighede bevind het en nog steeds hier ombid het was selfs wanneer hulle in isolatie was. David wat achter die skape was, niemand om mee te praat of gesels, het maar met die Heere gesels en die Heere aan bid en wonderlijke besalms ons te skryf. Daar is klomp voorbeelde in die Oud Testament, maar ook in die Nieuwe Testament, denk ons aan hulle wat in die tronk was en hoe dat hulle die Heere net aan bid het en sy naam groot gemaakt het en daar waar hulle sy naam aan bid en groot gemaakt het, het hulle sy teenwoordigheid ervaar. Ek vertrouw dat jy vanmorgen, al reeds die Heere sy teenwoordigheid daar in jou huis ervaar het en dat jy besondere ontmoeting en een connectie al reeds met die Heere gemaakt het vanmorgen. Nou, volgend het ons die voorig om te luister na een boodskap wat gebring word dier Nicky Wigget. Nou, die wat saam het ons alfa gedoen het die eerste ronde toe ons het geimplementeer het in die gemeente, sal van Nicky onthou, sal het ons gehelp en daar die implementeer. Nou, haar gemeente is bezig met die reeksboodskappe en sy het een van die boodskappe gebring en ek het die voorig gehad om onder andere ook daarna te luister en toe ek dit luister het ek dadelijk in my hart gevoel en ervaar ek sal graag wil hee ons gemeente moet ook die boodskap hoor want sy bring daar die boodskap in context in vandag in hulle is bezig met die reeks oor die verskillende verbonde, soos wat hulle doen met covenant, wat ons in die Bijbel van lees, en sy begin daar, so dit is die context wat het is, en dan trek sy dit dier na vandag toe, specifiek waar ons vandag is, in een lockdown situasie. En ek vertrouw dat jy vanmorgen sien ons sal ontvang uit dit, en ek vertrouw ook dat jy hier is sal hoor, en dat het jy ook sal help om te reflecteer, oor jy eie persoonlijke verhouding met die Heere. Ons wil baie dankie sê vir Nieke, sowel as vir haar gemeente wat vir ons toestemming gegeet en dan ook die preek vir ons aangestuur het en beskipbaar gemaakt het. Ons waardeer het baie en ons vertrouw dat die Heere ook vir hulle sal sê. Mag die Heere jou reiklik sê te wij na die woord van die Heere luister vir morgen. I just want to say hi to everyone that's watching today. Let us know how you're doing on our live chats. And just remember, we can still pray for you even though we, we're not there in person. So, so let us know. Um, won't you just close your eyes? I just want to pray for us before we start. Thank you, Lord, for this day that you have made. Thank you that your mercy is on you every morning and that we can rejoice and be glad today. Thank you that we can be glad despite our circumstances. Lord God, I just pray that your presence 
um, touches every person that's watching now and that they know without a shadow of a doubt that you are with them and that, um, that you're watching over them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, so I am so excited to be doing this sermon and I pick up right where Henny left off um, uh, with the story of God's relationship with, with his people some 500 years after God made his covenant with Abraham. God, in the meantime, had renewed his covenant through Abe's son Isaac and then through Isaac's son Jacob. What they didn't know, that's um, what Jacob didn't know that was that his descendants would be in captivity for 400 years before God resurrected his promise through Moses. We're going to start off in Exodus 6, chapters 2 to 8, if you want to turn to your Bibles and read with me. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And I also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians kept in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. There are seven awesome, glorious promises that the Lord makes to his people in that little portion of scripture. He says, I will bring you out. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you. I will take you as my people. I will be your God. I will bring you into the land and I will give it to you as a heritage. The Israelites then watch as God makes fools of Egypt's gods and Egypt's divine ruler through the 10 plagues. The last one being the death of the firstborn unless your doorpost was painted with the blood. Just as the 10 commandments became symbolic of the fullness of the moral law of God, the ten ancient plagues of Egypt represent the fullness of God's expression of justice and judgment upon those who refuse to repent. Each plague corresponded to one of Egypt's god or goddesses, and as God brought Egypt to his knees, he quickly took his people from being slaves of one of the most powerful nations on earth to going to, through a series of frightening miracles and being set free. They marched out of Egypt with their former masters, showering them with gifts and gold and silver and clothing. They witnessed the impossible as God led them through dry ground in the midst of a parted sea. They saw God destroy the most powerful army on earth as he parted the sea and the waves came crashing down on their enemy. As they walked away from the Red Sea into the wilderness, the Israelites didn't know what to expect. They complained about no food and water. So God provided manna from heaven and water from a rock. Then they complained about the monotony of their diet. At one point, they even wanted Moses to dead. But finally, they arrive at Mount Sinai, the God's chosen place to reveal himself to his people and enter into covenant with them. This was a DTR moment. And for those of you over 40, a DTR moment means it defined the relationship. Anybody over, under 40 will know what that means. I think that Henny and I had a DTR moment probably two weeks after we met. I knew that I was going to marry him. So have you had your DTR moment with the Lord? God brought the Israelites out of Egypt. He saved them. He fed them. But that was all about what they knew and their relationship so far with the Lord. This gener generation of Israelites probably didn't know God that well. They'd been, um, they, their ancestors had been captives for 400 years and they'd obviously picked up some of the religious attitudes that the locals had and were, might have worshipped other gods. God had to introduce himself to them and teach these people how to be in a relationship with him. Let us now go to Exodus 19 where Moses goes up the mountain to hear from God and get the law. Then Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, 
This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenants, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are, spe are to speak to the Israelites. And if you hear that kingdom of priests and a holy nation, if it rings a bell for you. God says it again in Peter, you are a chosen generation, a holy priesthood, a holy, holy people. The Israelites were God's treasured possession. He was using this moment to identify himself to his people, to tell them about their new identity. God wants to transform his people from broken, dirty vessels to a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They could now rest in the security of knowing they were treasured and protected by God. It was also here that God set the terms for how this relationship would work. Let's go to verse 10 and 11. Still in Exodus 19. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all his people. God calls the people to consecrate themselves. They needed to set themselves apart for a specific purpose. They had to prepare themselves for an encounter with God, because in three days they were going to hear him speak. Exodus 19 verse 16. On the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountains and a very loud trumpet blast. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. In chapter 20, verse 1 to 17, God speaks to his people in an audible voice and gives them the Ten Commandments. The people are so terrified at the voice of God that they plead with Moses, and they say, You speak to us, and we will hear, but let not God speak to us, lest we die. So Moses draws near to the cloud and receives the rest of the laws from God. These are given from chapters 21 to 23, and they include a lot more specifics than just the Ten Commandments. In chapter 24, Moses builds an altar to God. He erects 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Bulls are sacrificed to the Lord, and the people agree to totally obey everything the Lord has commanded. In chapter 24, verse 8, Moses then takes the blood, he sprinkled it on the people, and he said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with these words. And this is obviously where the Old Testament law came in. Unlike God's unconditional covenant with Abraham, God laid down an extensive code of conduct. This law spelled everything God expected for his people relating to all aspects of life. And these laws were legally binding to the people of Israel. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus explained that he came to fulfill the law and therefore it is no longer binding on us as New Testament Christians, which means we cannot take it and simply apply it directly to our lives. At the same time, we cannot disregard it and or take it as meaningless. The law shows us something of God's character his holiness, and his intention for his people. And the law shows us that God has every right to dictate to his created being how he can act. He has every right to set the boundaries on our moral conduct. This is an important thing to remember, giving the prevailing attitude of arrogance in our culture. The issue of the law has always posed difficult theological questions for us as New Testament believers. For we know we are saved by grace through faith. We can't earn our way to God by good works and keeping the rules. And there's nothing in the law itself that ever told the Israelites that they would receive salvation by perfectly keeping the law. And that is why God had to introduce all the blood sacrifices to provide a way for his people who could never and would never keep all the laws. In fact, it wasn't even 40 days before they broke their covenant. They built the golden bull and made an idol. So what became of the covenant? 
if this covenant was based on works or strict justice alone, Israel would be done for. But to show this covenant is based on grace, God actually renewed it in Exodus 34. How can so much grace be dispensed under this covenant? How can a righteous God give, forgive so much sin, iniquity and transgression? How can a judge let gu a guilty sinner go free? Were all the sacrifices enough for all the dishonor heaped upon an absolutely holy God by Israel's sins? The answer lies in the future, and Isaiah saw it most clearly when he said, We all like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned away out to our own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. That's Isaiah 53, verse 6. So God, under the Mosaic covenant, forgot, forgave because he looked forward to the coming of his son and the sacrifice that repaired all the injury done to God's honor through the disobedience of his elected people. There could be no covenant with Abraham, no covenant with Moses, and no new covenant without the coming of Jesus Christ. What was freely given under Mo Moses was purchased by Christ. I want to take you back to Exodus 6 and the promises God made to his people before he made his covenant and gave the law. They were, if you remember, there were seven of them. I will take you out. I will rescue you from your bondage. I will redeem you. I will take you as your people. I will be your God. I will bring you into the land. I will give it to you as a heritage. Between the I will be God and I'll take you into the land, 40 years passed. What should have been an 11 day journey took 40 years because of the Israelites' disbelief and disobedience. God imposed a 40 year lockdown on his people before they were released and able to see the promised land. God had already promised them victory. The land he commanded them to go in and take was already theirs. They simply had to trust and obey, but this they didn't do. God will never lead us where his grace cannot provide for us, where his power cannot protect us. Indeed, the Israelites had seen the powerful hand of God at work during the plagues and miracles of Exodus, and their unbelief displeased God. They walked by faith and not by sight. Hebrews 11 verse 6. Their failure to believe in God's word kept them from entering the promised land. This truth has never changed. The whole time I was prepare, preparing for this message, I was asking God, what do you want to say to your people through the Mosaic Covenant? I can give you all the facts on the Mosaic Covenant, and I've just done that. But what is it that the Lord wants to say to you today? As South Africans, we are in our second week of a 21-day physical lockdown. We are confined to our homes. And my question to you this morning is this. Are you in a spiritual lockdown? How long have you been wandering in the wilderness? It isn't God's job to get you to believe in his promises and to get you to walk in faith and believe his word. God has made his move. He sent his son to die for you and for me. A final sacrifice once and for all. And then he sent his spirit to be with us. Do you know? On the day that the Lord gave the law, 3,000 people died. But on the day that he sent his spirit, 3,000 people came to believe. Without the Holy Spirit writing God's laws on your hearts, without him softening your heart, you are going to be in a spiritual lockdown. You are going to wander in the desert, following a dead religion. Without knowing it, as a new believer, I walked around in the wilderness for 10 years. Because nobody told me about the promises of God in the promised land. I intellectually believed in Jesus Christ. I knew that he was my savior. But nothing in my life really changed. It was only after I was baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit that I entered into the promised land. God has so much more for us. If only we will just trust and believe. I really thought that I was enjoying my spiritual lockdown. I called it, I call it my wilderness years, because really that's what it was. I lived for the world. I drank and I partied and I thought that those things were, were going to make me happy. And remember all this time I was actually a Christian. I thought that if I pitched up to church on a Sunday, that was enough. 
that that's what being a Christian was all about, but it truly isn't. Don't stay in the wilderness where you have not truly died to yourselves, not really trusting that God will do what he says he wants to do, being fearful and afraid. Take the time now for an honest look at yourself, not through the lenses of condemnation, that's not how God wants to look at ourselves, but through the loving eyes of Jesus as to where you find yourself in your spiritual walk with the Lord. Are you still wandering in the wilderness? Maybe you've set up camp in the desert. Or maybe you're standing on the edge of the desert, looking over the River Jordan, checking out the promised land. You know what? The promised land is a place of peace and rest and joy, a place where God's richest blessings can flow in abundance. If you're wandering in the wilderness, know in the words of the great Gandalf from Lord of the Rings, not all those who wander are lost. Make the decision today to turn away from those things you know are displeasing to God. Those things that keep you walking in the desert places. Those things that keep you in a spiritual lockdown. Get out of your comfort zone. Pack up your tents and make the move out of the dry places into your inheritance as a child of God. I want to thank you today for, for watching the sermon and I just pray that for those of you who've really felt this message and, and know that you are in a spiritual lockdown in your life, I want to really just pray for you now that the Lord shows you and helps you how to move out of that place, how to move out of that place of um, going around and around and around the same path that you've been going. If you locked in pornography or drug addiction or alcohol abuse, um, Maybe you are feeling trapped in your marriage. I'm not sure what it is that's going on in your life. But if it's you, I want to, to just pray for you and, and just let you know that the Lord truly can set you free. But you need to be willing to say to him, yes, I acknowledge I'm in spiritual lockdown and I want to be free today. If you'll just close your eyes. Father God, I just pray for those who you're really stirring in their hearts that they are in a spiritual lockdown. I pray, Lord, that the water of your Holy Spirit will just pour into them right now, that you will set them free, that you will make a place away in the wilderness for them. Lord, I just see that there are dry, dry, dry places in people's lives. And if they just allow you to, to pour your Holy Spirit over them, Lord, I just see fields of flowers. I just see that you will bring life to them and life in abundance. Lord, show them that they cannot trust in their own ways, that without you leading and guiding them, they're not going to make it. Lord, I just ask that you bless every person watching the service this morning, today. And I pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah, I think we're going to speak out today. We're going to speak out again to begin to speak to you. To self eerlijk wees. Geestelike lockdown is iets anders. Nou, dit is nie een wetgever of regering wat ons vast sou of vastleid. Dit is keeses en besluite wat ons neem. En mag hierdie uitdaging jou weer aanvier om, om, om die vrye brand Christus is aan te grijp. Om, om jezelf volkome in te storten en uit, uit te storten in jou verhouding met Jesus Christus. Um, ons wil ook een beroep op u doen aan die einde van, van hierdie video om om getrouw te wees en, en dit wat jy bijdra. Ons gemeente is afhankelijk, ons uh, afhankelijk van, van die tiendes en bijdra's, maar, maar meer is dit, dit is ook een geestelike geloofstap en ons besef mense kruis waar, ons het rechtig empathie en sympathie daarvoor, maar, maar God is getrouw en kom ons is ook getrouw, kom ons is getrouw en die saad wat ons saai, um, aan die einde van, van die video gaan ons bankbesonderhede verskyn en jy kan betaal dier die EFT of Snapscan, maar as ek een ding by jy kan los, onthou, weet dit verseker, God gaan jy nie nie steek laat, en ek gaan nie sy hand van jou lewe wegvat nie, as jy aan hom vasthoud, sal dit definitief ook in jou vertrouw, en mag jy die week wat voorlee, jy jou geseend wees, ons sien hy dan om jou weer volgende zondag te sien, en mag jy tyd, speciale tyd, in die teenwoordigheid van die Heere spandeer. Ek wil gereed wees, vir die een wat kom, 
gereed wees vir die beide gom ek wil gereed wees as hy ons kom haal ek wil gereed wees as Jesus my kom haal kom aan die boos ek wil gereed wees vir sy koninkryk